That was one of the last recorded mating calls of the Kauai O'o, a male searching for a mate that does not exist. The Kauai O'o went extinct in 2023 officially for many reasons. Habitat destruction, disease like avian malaria, and invasive species like feral cats and all sorts of other things all played a role. But the Kauai O'o didn't go extinct overnight from all those factors. Instead, it was pushed higher and higher up into its range until finally it was gone. This process is something known as biological annihilation. Biological annihilation refers to when a species or a community of animals loses the vast majority of their range and their diversity. When I'm saying range, I'm referring to the geographic space that you would find a species. That's determined by actual data as well as some theoretical data to fill in the gaps. Let's take a theoretical population of animals and drive them to extinction. Where in their theoretically perfect circular range do you think the last holdouts of the species would be found? Do you think that they would condense somewhere semi-central in their initial range? Or do you think that they would be fragmented, spread in tiny micropopulations all across? Or perhaps they would be pushed to one far edge of their initial range? All of these are real scenarios known as habitat collapse, but one of them is more common than the others, and that would be the last scenario, amputation. When a species or community of animals is pushed to the far periphery of their original range. The other two types of range collapse that we talked about also have names. This one is shrinkage, and this one is fragmentation. They both happen in real life, but fragmentation is more common than shrinkage, which is one of the rarest types that we ever see. Why is amputation, this weird push away strategy to a far edge, the most common type of range collapse that we see when an animal's undergoing biological annihilation? Well, it has to do with something known as the contagion hypothesis. The contagion hypothesis, as far as I can tell, was popularized by two researchers, Lomolino and Chanel, or Chanel, he's either French or he's British, I don't know. They looked at the results of real-world habitat collapses across multiple different species and found that amputation was the most common, and then proposed some reasons for why that was. When an animal is undergoing biological annihilation, it's usually coming from some type of force. Now a force could be anything like human expansion and urbanization, climate change and invasive species, or even a disease. But either way, the pressure exerted from these forces is what drives an animal out of their initial range. Now in the real world, those forces don't come at an animal from a purely circular, surrounding it on all sides way. They come at it from a wave format. In disease ecology, this is something that's well understood. Several diseases will move through a population in a wave format, hence why this theory is called the contagion hypothesis, because the way that these animals are driven towards extinction is very similar to how a disease would pass through the population in a wave. The last remaining populations during this wave form extinction event are those that are furthest away from the initial location of the force, as well as the most isolated. Think about things like deforestation for human expansion purposes or logging purposes. These types of forces progress from one side, not as an attack from all sides towards the center. Some of the animals that Lomolino and Chanel looked at were things like the giant panda or the red wolf or the black-footed ferret, which you can just barely see but is pushed to a tiny little edge. The reason I found this topic fascinating is because I know as an ecologist, and you might even know this as well, animals that live on the edge of their range are not like the others. The edge of an animal's range exists for a reason. Sometimes there's a physical barrier there, like the Rocky Mountains in North America, or an ecological barrier, like that of the Amazon rainforest transferring into plains or rivers. In most cases, animals that live on this periphery edge are not thriving. They typically exist in lower numbers than that of the central parts of the range and lower genetic diversity. They're also highly prone to small local extinctions as they're exposed to a lot more stress than some central parts. Basically, the conditions on the edge are just enough that the animal can survive there, but definitely not great. So when biological annihilation happens in the form of amputation-style range collapse, wow, that was a sentence, 
you're left with the dregs of the population, not some super soldiers who survived because they were better than everyone else. In this paper by Rogan et al., they looked into some of the genetic consequences of different types of range collapse, specifically amputation, fragmentation, and shrinkage. The reason that they were examining genetic diversity is because it's considered one of the most important indicators on the success of a species. Genetic diversity directly contributes to a species' resilience, aka their ability to adapt to changing stressors. I've talked about this before in some of my black-footed ferret videos, but basically having more genetic diversity in a population is super important because when shit hits the fan, you want a lot of different options. So here's what happens to the genetic diversity and the relative connectiveness, so the ability for these animals to interbreed, under different range collapse scenarios. In shrinkage, they had the highest genetic diversity and they were considered the most stable with tons of connectivity. It's actually considered that shrinkage is the best option if you're gonna have any type of range collapse. There are species that don't thrive underneath it, but in general, most do well. And those that suffer don't suffer as extremely as the other options. So under amputation style range collapse, which remember is the most common style that we see in the real world, it was interesting to see that the size of the population was actually very comparable to the shrinkage one, and they had high connectivity. However, they had extremely low genetic diversity. Much of that having to do with the fact that the animals that already existed on the periphery already had low genetic diversity. When a range collapse does happen, some animals are able to disperse or move into the now smaller viable range, but a lot of times it is just the animals that already existed there to begin with and their descendants. In fragmentation scenarios, which do happen in the wild, animals were the least set up for success. They have the least connectivity, they have the smallest effective population sizes because of how they're distributed into small micropopulations, and the genetic diversity in those small communities it is tragic. Out of all the different types of range collapse, fragmentation is the most likely to directly lead to extinction. But it's not all doom and gloom. There is some good news. By better understanding these types of models and how ranges collapse, we can better adjust and try to prevent or even reverse them. Take amputation, for example, the most common type of range collapse. In that model paper, they found that in the amputation scenarios, due to the high connectivity but low genetic diversity, those populations would benefit most from reintroduction. However, that type of strategy would not be effective for something experiencing shrinkage or fragmentation. It's too late for animals like the Kauai OO, but it's not too late for others. That first paper was published in 1995, and the most recent was published in 2023. This is still a very active field, and we're always trying to get better as researchers. The more we know, the more we can do to prevent these biological annihilation scenarios or even reverse them when they do happen. Take the black-footed ferret, for example. There's been great progress there. I will sing the praises of the black-footed ferret forever. But hey, was this a super niche ecology topic and definitely not the first thing I should have picked for my very first horizontal YouTube video? Probably. But I still think it was interesting, and I think a lot of you will find it interesting as well. That's gonna be all from me, guys, but thank you so much for watching. Please let me know if you guys like this style of video, because I would love to do more of these.